Welcome to Black Hat Briefings, held November 21st through the 22nd, 2001, in Amsterdam. This is videotape number 14, Hack Proofing Lotus Domino. We're keeping you waiting. Okay, just brief introductions. My name is David Litchfield. I work for a company called Next Generation Security Software. On my right is my lovely assistant, Sharif Ahmad, again, one of my colleagues from Next Generation Security. Um, Today we're going to be talking about hack proofing Lotus Domino web server. So first I'm going to ask the question, uh, rhetorically of course, uh, what is Lotus? Lotus is an application server. It offers a number of services such as SMTP, LDAP, NNTP, web services, and of course the Notes database server itself. Now that's crucial. Notes. Quick and, uh, uh, explanation of who Lotus are. Lotus is a subsidiary of IBM and they write Lotus Notes. I'm sure everybody in here has at least once in their life come across Lotus Notes. Lotus allows us to interact with Notes databases via these various services I've talked about. Specifically, we're going to be talking about the web service um, as it's most commonly found accessible via the internet these days. So. What is a notes database, first off? For those who come from the traditional RDBMS background, it's not the standard database you're thinking about. A notes database is a document-driven database. It's not about tables and columns and selecting this and that. It's basically access to documents. Now, in your, um, whatever you call them, your, you know, your guide, um, you'll see a white paper I've written. In, at the top of that, there is a, a logical picture of what uh, Lotus databases could be considered as. They do have views, like a traditional uh, database does, but these views are sort of irrelevant. It's there so you can um, categorize your documents you know, with, with um, a certain form. So we have views in a Lotus Notes databases. Sometimes views are collected inside folders, we have documents, obviously. There are things known as forms that allow us to input data into uh, the notes documents. Documents themselves, when you drill down further, they are essentially just fields. So you might have a revised by field that says who updated that document last and so on. So this is what notes databases are. Um, moving on. I'm going to talk about the directory structure, as in like the file system uh, aspect. Where are these databases stored? Well, if you install Lotus, it creates a Lotus directory, and underneath that domino, um, where are we? The, the actual databases themselves are stored in this data directory. So Lotus domino data. Now, we have mailboxes in there. I, I don't know how clear this is from down there. But essentially what I'm highlighting is a, uh, a Lotus Notes database called mail.box. Lotus Notes databases generally have the file extension .nsf. Some of them have ns4, some of them are .box. They have the same logical structure, just the file extension is different. Other things we have are the standard databases, such as homepage.nsf, names.nsf. These exist in the data directory. Now, static HTML, or SHTML, therefore not necessarily static, are stored in a couple of directories below that. Data, Domino, HTML. Now, I bring this up because later on in the talk, I'll be showing you why this is crucial. Um, a quick explanation now. You have, as well as Lotus Notes databases, you can have template files that are used to derive database files themselves. Now, these template files are stored in the same directory as the data uh, directory, in other words, where the, the real .nsf or .box files are. And I'll show you later on how we can actually get access to these template files. One of them specifically is the web administrator template, um, webadmin.ntf. Now, the ACLs on webadmin.ntf allow an attacker access to it anonymously, and we can use certain parts of its functionality. The real web administrator, we're not actually allowed access to it anonymously. So this is obviously going to be something you, if, if you're trying to secure Lotus Domino, you have to be wary of. 
So, moving on. When we look at a Lotus Notes database online, again, those of you who have uh, Lotus Notes or Lotus Domino at home, you, you'll recognize this immediately, just simply by looking at the file extension. For those of you who don't have it at home, you may have surfed a website that uh, is running Lotus Domino web server, and you'll begin to recognize what we're doing. Uh, simply what we have here is a Lotus Notes database, bookmark.nsf, shown to us in a web browser. Now, Lotus Notes server is fairly intelligent. It can ascertain, sorry, can you go and still hear me? Uh, Lotus, server, Lotus Notes server can ascertain whether you're coming, making a connection to it via the web or via the Notes client and it will present to you an image set for a client, a web client, or a Lotus Notes client. Now, because we're accessing bookmark.nsf over HTTP, in other words, the web service, it will present this image to us. This, what we are presented, is known as a navigator. If a navigator has not been created, a database, when you access it, will look like this. Simply a list of views, nothing interesting. It's not like what a website should be. It, it, there's no glitz to it, if you understand what I'm saying. So people build a navigator to allow a web user to actually start drilling down for data in a nice-looking environment. Now, this isn't new, what I'm just about to talk about here. Um, we can bypass this navigator um, simply by requesting the default navigator. Every Lotus Notes database has something called the default navigator. And via a modification to the URL, we can actually request this default navigator. Now, as it happens, when I do it on my system here, now it's going to fail because there is a protection mechanism that you can put in place known as a URL redirection mapping to prevent this. So in other words, if anybody ever requests slash default nav open navigator, you'll be redire redirected to somewhere else. So indeed, if I request this, you know, it's redirecting me somewhere else and I'm not connected to the network. So this is why I get the page can't be displayed. It said, go and look somewhere else for it. The current protection mechanism document that says if you want to redirect requests for the default navigator to X, Y, and Z, it's broken. And you'll see how to prevent the brokenness in this document. For example, if I change the D of the word default into its hex equivalent, for example, 64, you'll see that I've bypassed that protection mechanism and got access to the default navigator. So that's one issue to be aware of. Um, having said that, preventing requests to the default navigator is not true security. The only way you can secure a Lotus Notes database is using proper ACLs. All of these clodges or fixes or workaround are only there for someone's peace of mind. Never rely on them. Now, this brings to question, what is Open Navigator? Question mark Open Navigator. You interact with the Lotus um, Domino web server through commands. Open Navigator is one such command. And as we can see, there is a slight security vulnerability with that that allows us to gain access to views. I'll talk about what that wins us later on. But for the time being, let's talk about these commands. We have um, a list of views presented to us. If we follow one of these views, there's no documents found, but interesting, well, not interestingly, if we look at the command now, it's changed to open view. So we have now two commands, open view and open navigator. There are other commands. And before I talk about ones that interact with databases, there is a, a command which is crucial to the operation, not crucial rather, crucial to know about that has an effect over the server as a whole. For example, this is the open server command. By default, the open server command will not work. The open server command simply lists databases for you. Um, by default, this will not work. Someone actually has to go in and make a modification. But as you can see, if they have done that, it could be considered as a security hole simply because I now have a list of databases that are accessible from this Lotus web server remotely. I, I don't have to guess names, I don't have to brute force it. So open server is something to be careful of. If you want to go home and check the open server command, if you get a list that looks like this, you're vulnerable. The way to protect against that is going to the server document. Um, 
go into the server document and prevent access. I can show you that now. I don't really want to get caught up in showing you how to protect. I, I'll just do it for this one here until the end. Um, server document, allow HTTP clients to browse the database. As you can see, it's currently set to yes. We want to click no for that. Uh, and edit and save the <coughs> edit and save the document, but then make sure you tell um, the HTTP process to restart, and you do that from the console. Tell um, HTTP restart quite simply, and that will reload and take uh, make these uh, settings effective. But let's continue with the commands. So there are commands that act on the server, and there are commands that act on databases. There are commands that act on the, the database as a whole, but the open view one is a command which obviously acts on views. Now, going back just slightly, uh, the default navigator problem, people often put the protection in to prevent people accessing the default navigator, but another command is available to us, read entries, that essentially does the same job, and no one ever protects against this. Um, it would help if I could spell entries. This will return an XML listing to us of exactly what the default nav navigator view will do. Importantly, this and the default navigator will not show you hidden views. They will not show you forms. They will not show you agents and everything like that. Um, we'll talk about how to get that information later on. But suffice to say, for the time being, the default navigator and the read entries command will only return a list of visible views. Um, so if, if you are going to be putting protection mechanisms in place for default navigator, you should make sure that read entries 2 is covered, because we can get the same information. Now again, what I'm telling you is probably not new stuff. Um, most of this stuff is probably fairly widely known. So let's drill down into the view now. We have things that work on views, yeah? open view. There are no documents in this one, so let's go to another view, the events view. OK, here are a list of documents. Um, now, like read entries, there is another command, read view entries, that again returns an XML listing of, again, spelling. Again, it's an XML listing of all the documents contained within a particular view. And as we'll see later on, views are irrelevant. You can access any document from any view. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that anyway. Uh, read view entries, that's another command that acts um, specifically on views. Now, we can get information about documents from here. For example, we have the unique ID, uh, the universally unique ID. Uh, this, in a namespace, gives us a unique name for a document. There is also a note ID here, 16BE. That is, well, in fact, I, I can get to note IDs later on. Essentially, there's several ways we can reference documents. And to do that, we would click on this. And as you can see, we have here, the, unite, the UNID of the view, and then the U, UNID of the document, and then there's our final command at the end. What are we going to do with what we're requesting? We're going to open the document. Um, opening the document is, is useful. We can read that information. Um, and indeed, that's why it's there. To, that's why people have websites. It's to tell you information, you know, offer services. However, what can we do as an anonymous user? We will probably never get from a standard website the ability to follow a link that says edit document. So we can actually just modify the URL. Where it says open document, just change the word open to edit. Press enter. And providing the permissions are such that anybody can edit a document, we're allowed to. So as you can see, we have a form here. Um, we can modify the event text. That's the only thing this form is allow, allowing us to do, is modify this. So I can put in here, test, submit. As you can see, the final command is save document, but it's told us that the form has been processed. Now let's 
have a look to see if it has been. If we refresh this, we can now see the event text has been changed. But we can only modify the event text, or can we? Well, if we look here, under basics, we have the term originating server. That is the field name, or a field name, in this document. So let's try something. And here's one for all those who've watched Blue Peter I did earlier. Um, I've created, taken their HTML form and actually input my own data here. Input name equals originating server. Value equals whatever I want it to be. So I'm going to attempt to modify um, a document field remotely without having ever been presented that opportunity. So if I show you this in a form, um, form.html. Um, we have, we'll change it to foobar. Submit. So I'm trying to change the originating server. So let's now open that document. And as we can see, originating server is now foobar. So even though we've not been presented with the opportunity to change a certain part of that document, we can still do so, whether, the, you know, uh, we're presented that uh, information in the form or not. So um, that's just another caveat to be uh, where, you know, careful of. So we have a list of commands. Open navigator, read entries, read view entries, open view, open document, edit document, save document. There are other ones such as open form. Um, if we go to within each database, if a form is in there, there is a special entry called default form that we can request, and that will give us the first form back listed in the database. Again, I'll show you later on how to actually get a list of forms back. Um, but essentially, we have a form here. So that's another command, open form. Sometimes you might not be given open form access, so we would just need to modify that to read form, and we can still even if we're prevented on one hand getting access to the form, using it in read mode, we can still get it. Now, again, later on we'll be speaking about the web administrator template file, and if we attempt to use its functionality in, in open mode, it will fail, it will ask us for credentials, but if we say, no, just use it in read form mode, it will actually give us details back such as text files, enumerate databases and everything. So. It's important to understand the difference between uh, open and read form. There are loads of other commands which we'll um, get into. Okay. Um, let's talk about deconstructing databases remotely. This is the same view that the default navigator would present if we gained access to it. However, as I already stated, this only ever prevents a list of visible views to us. Now, there is a way to remotely be begin to disassembling the application in terms of getting hidden views back, visible views back, forms, agents, icons, about documents, help documents, everything like that. And essentially, what we have is something called as the note ID. Now, the note ID is simply a reference to a file offset within the database itself. So we have an index. And listed in that index are note IDs that point to locations in the file where we can find this information. So, for example, if I request um, 102, I get an error message back saying invalid or non-existent document. Now, note IDs are issued in batches of four. For example, the next one we would attempt is 106. Again, it's a non uh, invalid or non-existent document. We would then try A. Again, there's nothing there. We would try F. Again, nothing there. We would then try 112. Now, notice the it's changed. We now have uncom unknown command exception. That says something's happened there. It's no longer an invalid or non-existent document. In terms of unknown command exceptions, as I'll explain later on, um, this is the result we would get back if it was an agent. So we continue the enumeration going upwards. We're looking for high-level database stuff, such as views, hidden views, and uh, agents and forms at this point in time. We'll get into documents later on. 
So we then go to the next one, um, 116. Again, unknown command exception. So we know something's there, we just don't know what quite yet. We then get another error message, couldn't find design note 11A. I'm just going to continue, as, as you'll see, um, 11AF. Invalid or non-existent document, 122. Right, now we've actually got a response come back. This is using statistics reporting, OK? Um, documents, sorry, not documents, databases have um, another command I didn't tell you about was the open about. So let's show you that one. If we go open about, we get the same thing. Actually, sorry, that's about. Let's do the help one, which is the correct one. Open help, which is another command. Essentially, the database has a help document within it. So by requesting 122, we found the help document, yeah? You would normally request a help document through open help. Again, as I, by mistake, showed you already, there is an about. No doubt when we go up, we'll find it. So we, we keep on going up, 126. No documents found. So we've found a view. Notice we don't need the command on the end, unless, of course, it's an agent, because agents you can't request using its note ID. You have to request it using its unique um, ID. Everything else we can come up with without putting its command, just by using its note ID. Again, going on up. Um, no documents found, so we've found another, another view. So we keep on going on up and up and up, and here we found another view, the events view. So we can send, essentially write a program that will send off 4,095 requests going through every single possibility up to FFFF. Remember, we only have to do it in bunches of four, uh, increments of four, rather. Um, and depending upon the response that's returned to us, we will find every high-level document um, such as views, whether they're hidden or not. Um, in fact, again, like they say in Blue Peter, here is one I made earlier. The alarms view, if I open this, 13A is its note ID. The alarms view is a hidden view. Now, if I um, request the default navigator, with this, there is no navigator, so I can just go straight to it. You can see there's an alarms view, but there is no dollar sign alarms view. So we've now found a hidden form. Hidden form, uh, not hidden form, hidden, hidden view. Um, hidden views are preceded with a dollar sign. So when we've uh, done some, you know, fired off this request, basically, uh, we have a list of things that have been found. Now, one of the interesting things about this, too, is let's request names.nsf. Names.nsf is the um, database that controls the service configuration. It's the, the address book, essentially. Now, by default, you are prompted for a user ID and password to access names.nsf. But even if we don't have access to a database, we can start as disassembling it remotely, finding out the note IDs and so on. For example, if I request 112, I'm prompted to log in. That tells me something's there. If I request 113, yeah, we get invalid or non-existent documents. So even though when we don't have access to names.nsf, we can still start to disassemble you know, remote applications. So we've now done you know, high-level things. Let's look at a standard view. Um, I'm now going to go into accessing documents. Um, if we look at the alarms view, there are no documents found. If we look at the events view, there are loads of documents in there. So we'll use the alarms view and the documents view, uh, the events view for, for this slight demonstration. OK. If we request again a note ID, 8F6, documents begin at or, or around 8F6 you know, for the note ID in terms of where its location in the index is. So I've requested AF6 there. I can then get the next document out, um, AFA. And again, I just continually add and add and add until I get a response such as 9992, invalid or non-existent document. They're all issued sequentially. 
If a document has been deleted, however, you'll get a 404, not an internal server error. Uh, 404 says document not found, 500 is obviously something's gone wrong with the web server. So we can just look at the web server response to actually start breaking it down and find every document. Now here's, here's the interesting thing. We have no documents found in this alarms view. However, if we tack on the end of that AF6, which was this document here, if I then request that, we can see, even though we've requested a view that says it doesn't have any documents in it, we can still access documents from other views by basically using its note ID. So again, when we are attempting to disassemble and find every document, um, disassemble a, a database remotely and find every document, um, all we need to do is find one view and start banging away for document note IDs, yeah? And we'll find every document. Um, so again, if you think something is hidden, don't, don't fool yourself into believing that it's safe just because it is hidden, rather. Um, it's very easy to start stripping out what exists in a database and what actually doesn't exist. So use database ACLs. Security through obscurity is obviously no security at all. Um, so that's how you would essentially start disassembling an application. Just bang away at the note IDs, analyze the response coming back, and work out whether you've come to the useful end. Um, if you haven't, request the next one plus four, then the next one plus four, and so on, until you start getting these responses um, that save, says you've come to the end. OK, so we've talked about that. We've done that. Let's talk about um, accessing template files. We spoke about the directory structure. Databases and template files exist in this data directory up here. Static HTML exists down here. Now, if I request of the Lotus server a .nsf extension, and so let's go .nsf. This is just an arbitrary request. Something .nsf. Lotus will look for this file in the data directory because we have requested a .nsf file, so it loads the, the NSF parser and passes that request to the um, NSF parser. Again, if we request a .box file, we're looking in that data directory. If we request HTML, you can see there's been a different response. So some, that tells us something else is dealing with this request. .html files are searched for in this HTML directory. Let's pick one. There's a text file in there, actually. Let's go for that one. D, what was it? Too many arms. OK, so there's that text file that exists in the HTML directory. Again, if I request .ntf, which is the file extension for a template file, it looks, looking at the response, it looks in that HTML directory. And you can use something like sysinternals filemon to actually work out what's going on, what and where are files being requested from. So knowing that ntf files, the template files, exist in a couple of directories up, and static content, and that's what Lotus considers a template file as, in other words, static content, it will look somewhere else. So what we need to do is trick notes, or, or Lotus Domino, rather, into looking in the right directory for a template file. Now, as, as far as I can tell, there is no way to do it using, you know, dot, dot kind of parent path bugs. There are, I've found, two ways to do it, though. Um, why do we want access to these template files? Simply because one of them is of interest, the web administrator template. We can access that anonymously. Um, I haven't, in all honesty, looked too deeply into the other template files. There may be something of danger in there. Um, but providing you're aware of this general problem, then you know how to protect against um, people accessing your template files anyway. So the first one is through buffer truncation. So what we're going to do is essentially trick Lotus Domino into believing we've made a request for an, a .nsf file, whereas in actual fact, we're requesting um, a 
template file. And we do that uh, by using a plus. Um, plus over HTTP is translated as a space. Now, essentially what we're doing is requesting webadmin.ntf space, 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 space. And if we go to the end of that, you can see .nsf on the end. So we've told Lotus we're requesting what appears to be a .nsf file. So it's going to pass that to the NSF parser, which will deal with our request. However, Lotus are obviously um, keen on security and want to prevent things like buffer overflows. So they will cut that buffer short. As it happens, if we put the right amount of spaces in and the .nsf on the end, when it cuts that buffer, it chops off .nsf, and the um, NSF parser, the database parser, will open up webadmin.ntf space, 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 and that will succeed. Unix is also vulnerable to this. You, normally, this space trailing space issue is an NT problem. There is an issue with the, the parser that allows this to happen on Unix systems as well. So just because you're running um, maybe on Solaris or AIX, you're still going to be vulnerable to this um, buffer truncation. So making the request. Sorry, it's just churning away at the moment. Need more RAM. So as you can see, it's starting to come down. Had I have requested it without this web admin dot ntf, we get the file doesn't exist because we're looking in the, the HTML directory, whereas in actual fact the NTF file exists in the data directory. So here we've we've tricked it. Domino web, web administrator. Unfortunately, if we view the source of this, it translates our um, pluses into percent twenties. Scrolling down. Where's it gone? Yeah, here yeah, you can see. So if we attempt to follow any of these links, see all these percent twenties here. If we attempt to follow in any of these links, it's can be quite annoying. Oh, it worked. Huh. Well, you learn something new every day. System files. Right. This is requesting us for a user ID and password because it's tempting, attempting to open the form as opposed to reading the form. So if we... Right, so opening the form, we're not allowed access, but if we read the form, we do get access. And essentially, what we can do is put our own file name in here, requesting body. Um, this isn't actually going to work because I've corrupted, unfortunately, earlier on today, um, playing with something, um, some of the, uh, the Lotus script. I will show you something that does work, though. I know because I just tested it when we started. Um, we're going to access um, a list of databases remotely. DB list, um, question mark. If we did open form, we'd be prompted for a user ID and password. But by changing it to read form, again, it's just churning away. Oh, wrong. As you can see here, there's a list of NSF files and everything like that. So we've it, I hit uh, debug this script, which I didn't mean to do. Let me close it. No. Okay, let's do that again. Web admin .ntf. DB list, question mark, read form. So as you as 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 you can see, what we're essentially doing is using the web administrator template file to do things to the you know, this system we shouldn't be able to do. 
Um, we have a list here, bookmark.nsf, admin 4.nsf. So this tells us where to uh, start beginning checks for. You know, let's go and access uh, NGS software.nsf, what's in there, or customer database.nsf, or credit cards.nsf, whatever. Um, those might be hidden from view, but by using something like this, we can actually get this information back. Um, again, you shouldn't ever rely on obscurity, uh, security through obscurity. Uh, protect yourself using proper ACLs. So this buffer truncation is one way to get access to it. The other one is with a replica ID. Um, a replica ID is essentially a number that allows um, two databases that reference the same database to exist on two separate systems, and the replica ID is used to coordinate changes to that. Now, a replica ID, as I said, is a number, and the replica ID of um, the web administrator template, because templates are essentially databases, they just have a different extension, is 852566C900126644F. That's what a replica ID looks like. Now, again, we can actually make a request to Lotus Domino web server. If we have requested a what appears to be a replica ID, Lotus Domino will look in the, the relevant data directory, not the HTML directory, because it assumes we must be requesting a database file. So by requesting the web administrator template file through its replica ID, again, we gain access. Now, what's going to happen here? Again, it's going to be saying webadmin.ntf. Um, if we view the source, you know, it's been returned to us. If we look at the title up in the corner, we've got access to the web administration template. All we need to do is then start taking these frames and accessing them directly. For example, we can go back to dblist and read the form. So. The two ways to get access to the template files is one, through buffer truncation, and two, um, using the replica ID. To get the replica ID of the web administrator template file, you need to um, open up catalog.nsf using a special trick. Um, let me find it. Um, right, catalog.nsf. If you hold the Control, Shift, and H key down, when you open up a Lotus Notes database with a client, it will present to you a list of hidden views, not just the visible views. So as you can see here, um, I have hidden views. Those preceded with dollar signs. If I didn't hold the Control, Shift, and H key down, these wouldn't be presented to me. Replica ID, uh, dollar sign replica ID is a hidden view. Um, and we can start getting the replica IDs out of every single database on there. Now, the problem is with the web administrator template file, because it's part of the install of Lotus, the replica ID on my machine is going to be the same on his machine as his machine and her machine. It's, it's standard, so this is, um, the, the problem is exacerbated by that. Um, my names.nsf will have a different replica ID from the one on your machine or your machine but the web admin.ntf is the same across every, every machine, whether it be Unix um, or an NT system. So if you want the replica ID of the um, web administrator template file, you can get it from the hidden view replica ID under the catalog. Now, in terms of protecting against the buffer truncation issue, um, We've worked closely with Lotus in helping people protect against this. There are two ways you can go about this. One, using um, the uh, designer client, you can actually modify the ACLs on the web administrator template file. Secondly, um, as I speak, um, Lotus, uh, the next version of Lotus, is just about to come out um, sometime in November. It might already be out. I haven't checked my mails yet. Um, and in terms of the re replica ID one, um, again, modify the ACLs on webadmin.ntf, or indeed delete it. If you don't believe it should be there, um, if you don't want it on your system, just delete it. And I would even go so far as deleting webadmin.nsf, the real um, web administrator database. 
Um, that's one of the biggest problems um, of websites, having administration scripts and so on available on a production box. So hopefully um, I've shown you, you know, how easy it is to disassemble uh, Lotus applications, um, why you need to protect yourself because of that. I've shown you a couple of new uh, tricks in terms of breaking into it and how to protect against yourself from that. So um, in your manual things, there is a, a white paper that goes over exactly what I've spoken about today. Um, so please have a read of that. Um, are there any questions at all? Yeah? Well, um, in terms of UK law, um, I, I don't know about um, the laws of other countries. Um, I obviously have to concern myself with UK law, having come from uh, coming from the UK. Um, we have the um, Computer Misuse Act, thank you, um, and essentially that says um, I will go to jail if I, without authorization, modify data remotely. Um, now, if I, for example, take someone, someone's document, you know, we open the document, and I sit there and go edit document. Oh, look, I can edit that document, and then I make changes to it. Yes, I believe um, the, the, the attacker would be liable for making those changes. Just because someone's um, configured their server poorly, why should they be held responsible? If I don't lock my front door to my house and someone burglarizes me, should they not be held accountable? Or should I be held to blame because I left my front door open anyway? The insurance companies out there might have a, a couple of things to say about that if I'm leaving my front door unlocked. Um, but essentially, that person will be tr still tried in a court of law. So um, it, was that what you were driving at? Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, um, They've got a stronger case, anyway. Um, I wouldn't like to be the person who tries that, though. You know what I mean? Sure. Any other questions? Oh, um, there were some other things I needed to talk about. Good resources, by the way. Um, dominosecurity.org. In the, in the document I've written there, um, I've actually said .com, so please uh, make that modification. At the end of the document, um, dominosecurity.org, not .com. Uh, the guy, uh, Chuck Cannell, his name is, um, maintains a, a site on Domino Security, very good. And uh, Ian from IX Security uh, today is releasing a tool known as ID Password Recovery. Um, can I read out the URL, yeah? Yeah. If, if you want to write this down, http colon slash slash dub 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 dot secure, that's Charlie Quebec Uniform Romeo Echo dot net slash tools HTML. Um, do you want to describe what the tool does?
Um, talking about ID files, uh, anybody who is running Lotus Domino with Internet Information Server, you, you'll know you actually create a directory, a virtual directory, that is there for the use of Domino, and you uh, link the ISAPI, DLL, in and so on. Um, the problem with that, doing that is, if you've not associated or made it read um, access prevented, essentially I can go to your virtual directory that is used for Domino and download your server.id file or cert.id file or pretty much anything that isn't a .nsf extension. For example, if you haven't associated .box with the ISAPI filter for, for Lotus, I can just go and download your mailboxes as well. So that's another thing to be careful of. And unfortunately, um, the current Lotus documentation does not go into this, um, ensuring that you should, one, set it to read access should not be given, and secondly, associating .ns4, .box, and .nsf. Um, that will prevent people downloading your um, .box files directly, as opposed to interacting with them over the internet. Um, sorry, any other questions? Sure. Uh, yes, for example, there are a couple of uh, DSK files, such as cache5.dsk. It works too. Um, cache5.dsk essentially is there to show you um, what key changes have been made, um, what icons have been requested, and so on. You c the, the only thing it's good for is getting replica IDs out remotely. So your names.nsf your replica ID will be different from mine, but if I want yours and you've ever requested names.nsf, there will be an entry in there with the replica ID for names.nsf. So I can then remotely get your NSF file using the same trick. There are other files. If I request, say, server.id, which again is in the same directory, it says, it reports back, this is not a valid database file, so we don't get that information back. Any other questions? No? Well, I'll wrap up here and say thank you very much for attending, and uh, enjoy the rest of your stay in Holland. Thank you.